uh, I remember how the Bay of Bengal had kind of entered the land and the whole town of Paradip, including villages surrounding it, were under the sea. I could see it from the first floor of my house, my own ground floor, up to the half or even more than that of the window was under sea water. My this furnitures were floating in the water, and we are confined there for 48 hours like that. If you know everything but don't know how to express it, you won't make a good officer or good uh, uh, executive anyway. I grew up in Bhubaneswar. My father was a doctor in the capital hospital and I grew up in the hospital compound. Uh, I studied here. I was, uh, what you can say, a good student, like uh, maybe in the first 20 in the HSC board and first 10 in the university. I, uh, I was academic minded, so I didn't have uh, a very strong uh, kind of uh, struggle or ambition in life, except that I will uh, try for the civil services, the IS. But since it is chancy, nobody can guarantee that you will get it, I would uh, fall back on an academic career. In fact, as soon as I passed uh, MA in political science, I became a lecturer because in those days you got a lecturership immediately after you passed based on your career. If your career is good and your bars are good, it was given on an ad hoc basis immediately. So I became a lecturer. But the same year, I also appeared for the IS and I got it in the first chance. Oh, I was mainly a student, but uh, I was also interested uh, uh, in other activities. In those days, we had... Uh, a strong uh, um, Boy Scout movement in the schools. And I was one of the first from Orissa to become a president scout. Maybe I would be the second boy to become president scout, if I remember. And uh, in those days, there were very few president scouts. So the next year I became president scout, I was selected to represent India in a jamboree abroad. So that was my first visit abroad. Uh, right uh, when I had passed from the school. Uh, the, the, the studies and uh, scouting were my two main activities and the only game I played was football because uh, we had in the hospital compound a large field and we had uh, regular football matches and uh, that's how I grew up and uh, I very much wanted to work in Odisha but uh, the allotment of cadres was uh, by a kind of lot, you can say it is a roster lottery. Uh, so I got Gujarat cadre. But looking back, I don't regret it. I think uh, working in Gujarat uh, gave me a perspective which is quite different from what I would have had if I had worked in Odisha. Uh, the mindset of people at that point of time it's quite different in a state like Gujarat from what it was in a state like Odisha. Gujarat was a developed state, so people were more positive, more appreciative of good work. And, uh, uh, and you could uh, see how it is the people who actually make a place what it is. It is not so much the administration, not so much the government. And the Gujaratis have it in them uh, to promote what is in the common interest. Uh, that is why setting up a project in Gujarat and setting up a project in Odisha in those days, things are changed, of course. It's quite different. In IAS also, it is not that uh, you don't specialize. Uh, the early part of my career, after the district and regulatory posts, everybody has has collector, DDO, uh, uh, and uh, director of uh, transport, uh, that kind of postings, uh, you tend to get a subject matter administration and to, uh, I mean, I didn't plan it that way, but I became a kind of a person for textile handicrafts and handoffs. That's the first six, seven years of my mid-career. 
and uh, I was um, as MD of Gurcheri, but was Gujarat's handicrafts and looms, and then I was an ADC handicrafts in government of India. That gave me a very close experience of India's culture, India's rich heritage, the skills of our craftsmen, teachers. But soon enough, uh, when I went back to Gujarat from Delhi, from government of India, I became secretary industries, and. Um, uh, those are the days when, uh, you know, the government was promoting private investment in infrastructure. Gujarat was the first state uh, to promote private investment in roads, uh, ports, and other infrastructure by setting up a body called Gujarat Infrastructure Development Board. I, I was the first CEO of that board. I drafted the GID Act and uh, became its first CEO. And uh, from, uh, from it, from a you know, soft area like handicrafts, textiles, I was into a very challenging, hard, uh, I mean, a very challenging project uh, intensive area called infrastructure. From there, there is no looking back. The uh, rest of my career was about infrastructure. Uh, except that uh, my big infrastructure gave me some, you know, confrontation with disasters. So, disaster management became another area of my expertise. From there, I got a chance to come back to Odisha and serve here on deputation as chairman of Paradip Port. Actually, Paradip Port is under the shipping ministry of government of India, so it was a deputation to government of India, but the posting was in Odisha. I kind of rediscovered my roots in Odisha, coming back here after 29 years of working elsewhere. I could uh, rediscover my roots, my friends, and the people, and uh, that was a very challenging time in uh, Paradip. It was uh, expanding from a seven birth port to a 13 birth port, almost more than double its capacity. It was in the process of mechanizing. And on top of it, in uh, 1999, when I was halfway through my assignment, we had to face the century's worst super cyclone in Paradip. And Paradip was uh, at the, you know, under the eye of the cyclone. And you can imagine what was happening there. I never bargained for this. But that experience taught me a whole lot of things. Uh, my memory of that disaster, which is which will perhaps uh, 25 years uh, in the past, uh, just next year, 29th, uh, uh, October as the World uh, Disaster Day, Disaster Management Day. Uh, I remember how the Bay of Bengal had kind of entered the land and the whole town of Paradip, including villages surrounding it, were under the sea. I could see it from the first floor of my house, my own ground floor up to the hub or even more than that of the window was under sea water. My, this furniture were floating in the water, and we are confined there for 48 hours like that. Uh, but uh, at the end of it, uh, from the port town, nobody died except there was only one casualty because we were one of the first to track the cyclone through an American naval website, and we knew exactly what was going to happen. That is going to be one of the first cyclones. So we had shifted all the people from low lying areas to shelters and uh, the only death was because somebody who had a, a cattle shed outside wanted to go out and find out about his cattle and he was uh, swept away by the water uh, but uh, the post cyclone was very trying we had not only to bring back the port into operation we had to look after the surrounding villages uh, they didn't have food they didn't have road they didn't have water they didn't have medicine uh, and uh, I must say we came out of it in a shortest possible time and brought back normalcy, at least in the uh, port town and the area immediately surrounding it. That was one of the very, mm. uh, you know, uh, unforgettable uh, incident of my career that I cannot but mention. There's a lot to mention about it, but that would become another session. 
after uh, d- doing my stint in uh, Paradeep for five years, I went back to Gujarat and became the MD of uh, one of the world's largest uh, uh, water resources project, uh, namely the Sardar Sarobar Dam. Uh, that was again a very challenging experience in uh, water uh, management, hydroelectricity, and uh, on top of it, rehabilitation uh, against a whole lot of opposition from environmentalists uh, who perhaps were a uh, uh, little mistaken about certain aspects of the project. It is there that something very, you know, very important happened in my career. Uh, I got an offer from uh, uh, two of India's uh, leading business houses, Tata Steel and uh, LNT, who had formed a joint venture uh, to build a port at Hamra in Orissa, uh, whether I would like to leave the government and come back and become the MD and uh, build this dam in Dhamra. So this was again uh, second or third chapter in my career. Uh, difficult to take a decision because I had... Uh, uh, nine years, eight years of service left. And those eight years, as you know, are the years when you reach the pinnacle of your career. And uh, But I decided to come to Odisha because, uh, I, in fact, I remember when I left the Chief Minister of Gujarat, uh, who is now the Prime Minister of India, asked me, why do I want to leave uh, a project when only 10 meters of the project is left to be completed? And why can't I wait till that is over? And I told him, sir, in Gujarat, uh, the system is in place. Even if I am not there, the dam or the project will be completed. But in Odisha, doing a project is uh, a Kurukshetra. It's like a war. You have to fight with so many forces. And uh, this is a most challenging, and it's in my home state. And I would love to go back and do this project. And he agreed with me and uh, wished me well. Uh, that's how I came to Odisha again for a second time. And uh, doing a port in Gamra was again another experience. Like Sardar Sarovar here also, I had Greenpeace and other environmental organizations opposing the port. I had to engage with them to make them understand how we are not here to kill olive ridley turtles or damage the environment, how we do it in the best possible way so that the development will take place and the environment will also remain in place. Uh, and that is what we proved. Uh, the Amra is the first uh, port where, or the first coastal project where the lights are designed as per the dark sky friendly manual of uh, Western America. Uh, you know, you have... Uh, huge uh, illumination of the ground where the stacking and operations take place, but the sky continues to be dark. You can see the stars. Uh, you know, that kind of very special measures we have to take in Dhamra, do it in a manner that it doesn't destroy the environment. And uh, true to what we had promised, uh, the visit of olive ridley turtles has not been affected at all by the port or its operations. In fact, the number has increased in the subsequent years. Yeah. Something happened which I had not uh, planned, but uh, the carrier, you know, it, uh, it, it's like a, it, it's like a sheep on sail. It's like a boat, you know, it goes from uh, one area to another. You can't stop it. Uh, the Dhamra port was taken over by the Adani group. And the Adani group had uh, got uh, uh, a kind of um, MOU to build a port in Kerala at Vilinjam. And uh, they suggested whether I can go to Kerala to build that port since I have experience in starting new projects. Kerala is another challenging place. As to start a project itself is a challenge. I stayed there. I used to go there every week and come back. That was the arrangement I had made with them. And uh, I, we completed uh, the drafting of the concession agreement, which I signed with on behalf of the Adani, with government of Kerala. And uh, and we started the project. The project is yet to be fully completed because I had to leave after my assignment was over. I worked there for three years. And since then, I've been a consultant. Well, it's not great achievements, but I believe 
building port uh, is uh, it's also a kind of uh, contribution to the country's economy because uh, uh, if you remember when India was doing very well in the first uh, around 2005 2006 but our uh, rate of growth would exceed uh, double digit it, it, the highest it rose to was 8 point something or 9 uh, the then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh once said that the only reason we could reach a double digit is because our port capacity didn't support the growth. And today, fortunately, we have expanded and the country has very good port capacity to take care of uh, future growth. I left out one thing that my encounter with uh, the cyclone in Paradip uh, was uh, hugely appreciated by the government of India. And uh, when I went back to Gujarat uh, to take over as uh, MD of Sardar Sarovar, the Gujarat had just awoken from a, another huge disaster, an earthquake in Kutch and parts of Gujarat. So uh, they made me, they gave me the additional charge of uh, CEO of the Disaster Management Authority, which had just been set up in Gujarat for post earthquake uh, construction or rather reconstruction. Uh, that job also was quite uh, close to my heart and uh, uh, in addition to looking after the construction of the Sardar Sarovar project, I used to visit Kutch frequently to look after the rehabilitation, reconstruction, post earthquake. This, uh, this was again internationally appreciated and uh, was adjusted the best uh, uh, administered project are uh, the most innovatively administered project uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, it got the Commonwealth Gold Award that year and I had gone to Singapore to a Commonwealth uh, um, get together to receive the award. People sometimes ask me did such a, an intensive job in Paradeep during the cyclone nobody recognized you. Oh, I tell them look you know Maybe I didn't do enough in Gujarat for the earthquake. I was not there during the earthquake. But I got an award for that. So God takes care that you are recognized somehow or other. In Odisha, at that time, uh, people were not appreciative of good work like they are today. Post-cyclone uh, was a, a period of uh, uh, each wing of the government or each... Uh, section of society blaming the other for mishandling, mismanagement, and uh, they couldn't see uh, the people like me who would have worked hard uh, even during that period. Yes, uh, I can say I've achieved many things, I've achieved great things. Uh, God has been kind to me and given me the opportunity to do what uh, I wanted to do. Maybe there are other things I could have done and have not been able to do because I haven't got the opportunity. One thing I have uh, seen in the, when you build a project, you get uh, some kind of insight uh, into how people think. And this is actually very crucial to the developmental uh, dynamics. Uh, that w why it is that you can set up a project in two years in Gujarat and it takes five years in Odisha and seven years in Kerala. Or uh, it is how the people, how the stakeholders, how the others around you cooperate with you during that project. And my take on that, whether it is in Gujarat or in Odisha, people are basically similar. It's not like they're different. I, I mean, yes, they, they are, situation is different, so they may behave in a different way. But at heart and inside their minds, they are similar. They are not very different. It's always easier to get things done if you are honest with them, if you are truthful with them if you don't make false promises to them. If you tell them what things exactly are, if you are doing a project, somebody says, sir, how many people are going to be employed here? And uh, I remember in Dhamra, I used to tell them, look, this is going to be a very um, automated port. I don't think I can take in more than 500 people. Today, you may find 5,000 people are getting work. So it's better to promise less and give more then promise more and give less. Uh, because um, I used to tell them, look, uh, I'm not building a port to employ all the people here. 
I'm going to build a port so that the port in turn will, will attract other economic activities. And those economic activities will give you not only more employment, but opportunity to employ yourself, opportunity to employ others also. And this is going to happen if you go to Dhamra. After that, uh, one of country's largest LNG project has come there. Uh, now a palletization plant is going to come there. Perhaps a power plant was always in the offing because it is so easy to get coal, imported coal there. Now, mm, uh, these things will happen over a period of time that place is going to change and it is already changing. And uh, sometimes uh, we, we expect too much from the very fast project which comes, which is not correct. But you can do it uh, if you take the people into confidence. In a backward area, I mean, the difference between, let's say, Gujarat of those days and Odisha of those days was that. If you go to Gujarat and set up a project, the people say, oh, the land value will increase, will benefit from that. And if they hold a share in your company, they'll say, my share value will increase. They think in the positive side. And here, uh, the people were suspicious. Oh, my God, they will. Uh, I, I, I remember uh, one of my first interactions uh, with the villages. One serpent said, look, uh, humko to, we, we are getting eggs for one rupee an egg. Uh, your people will come, we'll give them fat salaries and uh, the, uh, the egg price will go up and uh, we can't afford it. And I told him, why do you think like that? Why do you think if the egg price goes up to three rupees, you will uh, um, produce, um, you will uh, have poultry farms here and produce eggs and sell it at three rupees and make profit. Why don't you think of that way? Why are you only thinking of the egg you are going to eat? Why don't you think of the demand for eggs which will increase and which will give you opportunity for supplying eggs? It's just an example. So so, so the way people think in a, a backward syndrome, a syndrome is quite uh, different uh, from the way people think uh, in a place where things have already happened, development has already taken place. Uh, but uh, a truth and honesty uh, is uh, very important. Impartiality is important. People should not feel that a few people are getting away with all the benefits. Even if you are in the private sector, it is not necessary that you have to follow procedures. Uh, you must put in place a, a system in which uh, everybody has an opportunity to uh, compete. Everybody has an opportunity to avail the opportunity. Uh, one may not uh, get it, but if he feels that uh, the manner in which uh, the contract was awarded was fair, uh, he will not be unhappy. He will try next time. I have uh, other interests also. Uh, fitness, I'm a bit of a fitness freak. I have interest in yoga, sports. Um, I play golf. I'm an avid golfer. My wife is a singer, which uh, led me to a very a deep interest in music. I love reading all kinds of books, including fiction. My learning from life is, uh, again, the uh, truth. Uh, if, uh, you do not, uh, if you do not uh, try to uh, manipulate things, if you uh, see things as they are, face things as they are, take the bull by its horn when it comes, you have a greater chance of succeeding than if you I think that you will outsmart others so you can hide something, you can reveal something else and you can manipulate this situation. It doesn't work. If you think there is a subtle way of achieving, it doesn't work. Your search for a shortcut will always land you in a longer path. So if, if you know that there is a problem, first mitigate it, eradicate that problem and then take the next step rather than let me go ahead and, you know, let's see how, I, I mean, if there is an environmental issue, you can say that let me build the project and then see how I can manage it. No, you have to, you have to first do everything that is possible to make sure that the problem doesn't arise and then go ahead with the construction of the project. That's how I think, uh, uh, that's true of everything. How do you get into IS, or for that matter, a civil service? Um, the exams, uh, the uh, pattern of uh, uh, selection process 
has changed uh, quite a bit uh, from our times to today. But if uh, uh, if somebody asks me what was my approach or my style of uh, preparing for a civil service, uh, first it is academic, right? You have to clear a whole lot of uh, uh, papers, answer questions, uh, the theory part of it, and then the interview part of it. These are the two things. Uh, unless you do well in the theory part of it, you don't uh, go to the mm, interview or personality test part of it. Uh, we had a lot of papers to give. In fact, we had uh, uh, two compulsory uh, papers, uh, then two plus three uh, s subjects to choose from to appear in. So, so actually, there were five uh, subjects in which you had to prepare and appear. Uh, my approach was, and I found that this approach paid me, uh, incidentally, I got it in the first attempt itself, uh, is that uh, you can always uh, study the questions of previous 10 years, 15 years and find a pattern in them. Don't try to select questions and prepare answers. That way, if that question doesn't come, uh, then you know your effort will go west. Don't go by that. Uh, supposing it's a, let's say it's a uh, international relations. The paper is international relations or the paper is history. You may find from the questions that uh, if there are 10 questions to choose from, two or three of them are coming from this segment of that subject. Two or three are coming from another segment and two or three are coming from a third segment. Now, if you don't have time to study everything, it is better to select segment-wise than uh, question-wise. Because if you are thorough about a segment, let's say a, a period of history, uh, from, let's say, a, a 1871 to 1915 period, and three questions are coming from that period. If you are thorough about that period, then whatever question comes, however difficult, complicated, twisted, complex question comes, you'll be able to answer it, right? Instead of just going for one question from here, another there. So if there are three segments, out of his 10 questions come two and three from each or three and four from each, I would rather prepare myself to be thorough in two segments and even ignore the third segment altogether. That the two segments I'm thorough in is in any case giving me five questions and I'll answer those five questions with full confidence, full knowledge and full control. Uh, that is one thing which uh, if you ask me, I can give as a, uh, <laughs> as a strategy for approaching a competitive exam. Uh, the other part is about uh, the interview. Uh, there again, the only thing I can say is that you cannot, uh, you know, interview is not so much about how much you know, as how much, what kind of mind you have, how analytical you are, how clear you are in what you are saying. So clarity and analysis are more important than knowledge. And that comes when you are... Uh, a, relaxed, B, again, truthful and honest. Never try to make a show of what you are not. Whether you like it or not, your background will show. Like if I studied in government schools, come from a small town, it will show uh, in contrast with somebody who studied in a metro city and pu public school and grew up there. But that's not important. They are not looking for a smart guy to... Uh, be the salesman in a store. They are looking for a person to think coolly and take right decisions and uh, uh, guide uh, the political leadership properly. So they are looking uh, into your mind. They are not looking into how you pronounce the language, how you... But, but yes, you must be expressive. You must be good at expression because if you know everything but don't know how to express it, you won't make a good officer or good uh, uh, executive anyway. Uh, so, it's, it's good to be uh, expressive, it's good to be articulate, and uh, like we did, uh, you should always uh, take part uh, in uh, debates, group discussions. In fact, debate was another area where I was good at, I used to get most of the, uh, I used to win a whole lot of debate competitions during my student days. Uh, debate, debate is very important because I think uh, you can, you may know a subject very thoroughly. But in a debate, you are allowed only four minutes or five minutes or sometimes three minutes. And you have to make a point for or against a proposition. 
and how to organize your thoughts in such a manner that you can uh, convince the audience uh, in just three minutes. Uh, exercise your mind uh, uh, very intensely and you learn how to choose the right word. You learn how to speak correctly. You, you, you learn how to uh, be uh, precise. Um, uh, uh, and this comes with practice. The more, the best you take part in, the better will be your practice. Uh, so um, uh, never think that, you know, oh, I know everything. What if I cannot express it? No, you have to express it. There's no point in knowing if you don't know how to express it. Mm. Yes, I have worked in uh, government and I worked in private sector. Uh, what is the difference between the two? Uh, <laughs> uh, the government, uh, you know, if you think that, you know, you can become very rich by working in the government, it's not true. The government can never, the salaries today are much, much better than what it was. I joined the service and my first salary was 700 rupees per month. That is how I began. Um, even when I left the government after 29 years, my salary was just 27,000 take home, meaning total salary was 40,000 or so. I had hardly any savings. Whatever uh, money I earned was in the private sector where the salaries were much, much, much better. But that's not important, right? Uh, looking back at my life, I don't think I, ever, I would have missed out on anything if I had not left the government. And I, I would have gained in many other ways if I had worked, continued in the government. But I don't regret because I have also gained in uh, a different kind of experience, different kind of exposure by joining the private sector in the last part of my service. Uh, the difference is in government, um, uh, the system of incentive, disincentive is... Uh, uh, very weak, uh, whether you do or not do, whether you work hard or work uh, less, you get the same salary monetarily. So a person does well in government only through his own motivation, self-motivated, right? It's not that you do a good job and everybody will praise you or admire you or you will be given a medal. There are nowadays systems of recognition that didn't exist in our time. And district officers are rewarded for good job even during the service. But that's only part of it. The people who are doing extremely well in government or in government more than private sector, people who are doing extremely well in civil service are people who are self-motivated, who get huge satisfaction themselves from what they have achieved. If they do a good job, they feel happy. And that happiness cannot be given by somebody else. It is your inner happiness, your inner satisfaction. Uh, and that's a very precious thing. No amount of money can replace that happiness, that satisfaction. Uh, when you are very happy, satisfied with what you have done and get a sound sleep, that is your reward. In private sector, yes, the salaries are more, uh, the incentives for doing a job is there, the bonus is a very uh, substantial part of what you get. Uh, as remuneration, and uh, things are more uh, result-oriented. But then the private sector is also large. I had the advantage that I joined private sector in a field which I was experienced in in government itself, called infrastructure. Because ports, uh, railways, uh, power, uh, these were earlier the uh, monopoly of government. Private sector didn't exist in these sectors. So when the private sectors entered these sectors, they had to depend on people from the government and public sector who had the experience. And that is how people like me got in. I'm one of the first to resign from the government and join the private sector. And uh, they are also, uh, you had to handle uh, people like uh, in Dhamra, I had uh, two promoters, 50-50. Uh, and it was quite a challenge to keep both the promoters in, interested in my project because one was uh, primarily a steel maker, the other was primary, primarily a contractor, so not a promoter. Uh, so, 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 Dhamra port uh, being so important in the infrastructure uh, territory was neither the mainline uh, activity of Tata Steel nor the mainline activity of LNT. 
and uh, still to retain their interest so that they keep giving their equity share so that I keep getting the loan against the equity and continue the project was quite challenging. It had its uh, own intricacies that I was not trained in government and I had to pick up those uh, threads uh, almost uh, like a beginner. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And the companies which uh, I worked uh, with were very professional companies and uh, uh, therefore you could um, continue to have the same ethics uh, as you had in the government uh, without any problem. I feel very happy to be here um, and get this opportunity from OTAX uh, to uh, kind of uh, recount my own experience with life, uh, career and the journey so far. I hope uh, more and more people get this opportunity and uh, we learn from each other's journeys in life.